March 1974, over 50 women gathered at a park in Glebe, an inner city suburb in Sydney, carrying balloons and buckets, streamers and shovels, the collective of women arrived at Westmoreland Street, where they broke into two vacant single-storey terrace houses owned by the Church of England. They changed the locks on the doors and in large capital letters painted across the front of the two houses the words Women's Refuge. The establishment of Elsie, Australia's first women's refuge by a group of passionate feminist activists, was the catalyst for the development of the women's refuge movement in Australia. Within a year of the establishment of LC, 11 other women's refuges were operating around Australia. The women's refuge movement made explicit for the first time the link between domestic violence and the need for shelter and has been the driving force behind the politicisation of domestic violence since the late 1970s. However, between 2012 and 2014, over 40 years after the establishment of LC, the New South Wales women's refuge movement was decimated by the introduction of the going home, staying home reform. The reform represented the biggest restructure of the New South Wales homelessness services sector in over 20 years. Instead of direct funding being provided to small specialist organisations like women's refuges, these services were required to compete against larger, often faith-based organisations through a tendering process to retain their funding. Many locally run feminist women's refuges that had been operating since the 1970s were unsuccessful in this tendering process. Regional women's refuges were severely impacted by this reform, with 18 of the 27 existing regional refuges at the time being handed over to new service providers. As a result, experienced workers have been dismissed from their jobs and have consequently left the sector and the archives of some regional women's refuges have been lost in this handover process. Despite the recent and ongoing threats to women's refuges and the over 40 year legacy of the women's refuge movement in New South Wales, there has been very little academic scholarship written about this movement. Several histories of individual refuges in Victoria, Sydney and Western Australia have been written often by the same women who worked and volunteered within them. However, much of this scholarship discusses the movement from an almost exclusively urban perspective. And as a result, we know very little about the history of the women's refuge movement in rural and regional Australia. This is particularly surprising when we consider that by, the by 1978, of the 28 refuges in operation in New South Wales, more than half were located in regional centres. I've chosen two regional New South Wales women's refuges established at the height of the refuge movement in the late 1970s and early 1980s to act as case studies for my research. It is important to note that this study is not just a history of the women's refuge movement in regional New South Wales, it is also a feminist one and has thus been influenced by the field of feminist oral history. Drawing on the oral history interviews I have conducted with the women who worked and volunteered for both Carrie's Place and MDEA, the remainder of this paper today will argue that regional women's refuges had a different set of structural barriers to overcome when trying to support women and children experiencing domestic violence when compared to their urban counterparts. Much of the research that has been conducted into domestic violence in regional communities has found that physical isolation is one, if not the most difficult structural barrier for women experiencing domestic violence to overcome. In particular, research conducted in rural America has found that physical isolation experienced by women living in regional areas can exacerbate the tactics of control used by perpetrators. For example, tactics such as removing the telephone, disabling motor vehicles to limit mobility, closely monitoring the odometer on a vehicle and discharging firearms to intimidate are more successful in regional areas because of women's physical isolation and distance from neighbours. Whereas in urban communities, greater visibility would likely render these tactics less effective. Physical isolation was therefore one of the most significant structural barriers of regionality that both Carrie's Place and MDEA had to contend with and also overcome. Both MDEA and Care Cottage adapted the services they provided to effectively support women in their communities who experiences of domestic violence were being compounded by physical isolation. 
one of the most important ways that they did this was by providing women with advice, often over the phone, about how to prepare to leave a violent relationship. It is important to mention that providing advice to women experiencing domestic violence over the phone was not unique to regional women's refuges. For example, in 1977, the LC Refuge Collective told the Sydney Women's Liberation Newsletter that they had a 24-hour phone counselling service for women experiencing domestic violence. The collective told the newspaper that, quote, women ring us constantly to be advised of their rights and to talk. Although both Carrie's Place and MDA provided a similar phone service to their urban counterparts, it differed significantly in that both of these refuges were not only giving women advice about their rights, but were actively helping these women plan their escapes. One of the biggest obstacles that women living on farms and properties, for example, on the outskirts of town faced was a lack of transport. To overcome this barrier, MDA, for example, purchased a minibus to help transport women from their homes to the refuge when they had no other means of transportation. Harry's Place would also transport women from their homes to the refuge. However, this practice was stopped during the 1990s because it put the refuge workers at risk of potential harm by violent husbands and partners. Research that has examined women's experiences of domestic violence in regional communities has found that physical isolation can often lead to or be coupled with experiences of social isolation. Refuge workers for both Carrie's Place and MDA supported many women whose relationships with their family, friends and neighbours had dissolved while they were experiencing domestic violence. Some refuge workers, like Lynn Gunn, were acutely aware of how perpetrators of domestic violence used the geographical isolation of the Tari area to their advantage to socially isolate their victims. American sociologist Evan Stark, who popularised the term coercive control for contemporary audiences, has argued that victims of this form of abuse are commonly isolated from friends, family and other supports and are frequently deprived of food, money, access to communication and transportation and other survival resources. More recently, journalist Jess Hill, in her book See What You Made Me Do, Power, Control and Domestic Abuse, posited that perpetrators of domestic, of domestic violence who use coercive control don't just abuse their partners to hurt, humiliate or punish them. They use particular techniques such as isolation, gaslighting and surveillance to, quote, strip the victim of their liberty and take away their sense of self. It is also important to note that whilst women living in regional areas who are trapped in violent relationships often experience some form of social isolation, regional communities themselves can often be socially isolated. Regional communities are often small and such close relationships can lead to an environment in which anonymity is extremely difficult to obtain. A lack of anonymity in a regional community where a lot of people are related and everyone knows everyone often for a long time may mean that the nurse, police officer or social worker in a regional community may be related to the abuser or be a close friend. For example, a study conducted in 1997 by Australian sociologist Margaret Alston found that women who had experienced domestic violence in regional communities often commented on the fact that when accessing services in town, they could not be assured of confidentiality. Both health centres in the regional areas where Alston conducted her interviews were located in prominent positions in the town, and staff noted that even parking the car outside the local health centre was problematic for women seeking help, as the town network ensured that privacy is often difficult to obtain. A lack of anonymity was also a problem that impacted regional women's refuges and their capacities to support women in their communities experiencing domestic violence. Although their locations have changed over time, both Carrie's Place and MDA's refuges were both located in the centre of their respective towns, and therefore keeping these locations anonymous was extremely difficult. It is important to note that although they rarely advertised their locations, urban women's refuges also had problems keeping their locations a secret. However, keeping the locations of regional women's refuges a secret was made even more difficult by the small nature of regional towns. Carrie's Place and MDA responded to the lack of anonymity afforded in their respective towns in two very different ways. Carrie's Place appears to have responded similarly to urban women's refuges, and they tried their best to keep their refuges location a secret. They also worked with the local community to try and pres preserve the refuges anonymity. Unlike Carrie's Place and most urban women's refuges, 
MDA's Lynn's place was not as concerned with concealing the location of their refuge. Rather, refuge manager Leonie Maguire recalls that the refuge accepted that it would be futile to try and keep the location of the refuge a secret. And therefore, she recalls that, quote, it became a non-issue. Similarly, June Ryan, who worked for Lynn's place in the 1990s, remembers that, quote, everyone knew where the refuge was, so there was no secret. It was in the phone book. Most women's refuges concealed their locations to protect the women and children who were fleeing violent husbands and partners. Surprisingly, however, although the location of Lynn's place was public knowledge in Tari, Leonie Maguire can only recall two incidences when perpetrators of domestic violence approached the refuge. In fact, she believes that Lynn's place's attention to security, coupled with the refuge's regional location, could actually be an advantage. The final barrier of regional life that I would like to discuss is a lack of services. Research that has examined regional women's experiences of domestic violence has found that a lack of or limited availability of social and public health services in regional communities can often exacerbate women's experiences of domestic violence and keep them trapped in violent relationships for much longer than their urban counterparts. Very little of this research, however, has considered how a lack of or limited availability of support services has affected how regional women's refuges have operated and how they have support the, supported the women and children coming through their doors. Both Carrier's Place and MDA were the only services of their kind in their respective regions when they were established in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and therefore they worked extremely hard to create their own networks of support within their communities. For example, both refuges drew heavily on the support of local service organisations in their towns, such as the Lions Club, Rotary and the Country Women's Association, as well as other smaller community groups. Sandra McCallum, who worked for Lynn's Place throughout the 1990s, recalls that although there was a general lack of other services and resources in the community, service clubs and community groups would provide the refuge with not only monetary support, but also practical support. Lynn's Place was located much further than Carrie's Place from a major city centre such as Newcastle, and therefore the refuge workers at Lynn's Place also made important connections with individuals in their community who could provide women experiencing domestic violence with additional support. For example, over time, Lynn's Place had two female solicitors on their management committee who provided women staying at the refuge and those in the local community who were experiencing domestic violence with free legal advice. Lynn's Place also built close relationships with local doctors who were sympathetic to the plight of women experiencing domestic violence. As a result, the refuge could send women who needed medical support to these doctors, knowing that they would be safe and properly cared for. Lynn's Place also employed an in-house in counsellor, Sandra McCallum, to provide refuge residents with much needed psychological support. This was particularly important because during the 1990s, Sandra was the only counsellor specialising in domestic violence in the Tari area. There was a range of structural and cultural barriers unique to regional communities that have shaped how women's refuges like Carrie's Place and MDA have operated and supported women experiencing domestic violence. It is important to note, however, that when conducting interviews with women who worked and volunteered for both of these regional refuges, it became clear that many of these women understood their refuges regional location as not only presenting several challenges, but also certain advantages. The first advantage of being located in a regional location, which workers at both Carrie's Place and MDA identified, was that they knew the area and they knew it well. The closeness and familiarity of regional communities could, as this paper has already outlined, create additional barriers that regional women's refuges had to contend with. However, it also meant that refuge workers often had a very good understanding of the community they were working within. For example, Patricia Ping had grown up in Perfleet an area that for much of the 20th century was the Aboriginal reserve on the outskirts of Taree. Patricia had spent much of her early life in Taree before moving out of the area when she was a teenager. She returned to the area to work for Lynn's Place in the early 1990s. Similarly, workers at Carrie's Place also believed that being located in a regional refuge enabled workers to have a much better understanding of the Maitland region, its culture and its people. The refuge workers at both Carrie's Place and MDA were aware of the challenges that working in a regional community could pose. However, they often used their refuges' regional locations to their advantages. Knowing the community and how it operated provided them with the opportunity to harness the closeness and familiarity in their respective areas 
and use this to provide women and children with the best possible support. The second biggest advantage of working in a regional women's refuge that Carrie's Place and MDA workers identified was the community support that was given to each refuge. Both Carrie's Place and MDA were supported by their communities even before they first opened their doors. And once they had opened, the community donations of money and goods kept both services operating until they secured government funding. For both refuges, this community support has over time come from various sources, including individuals, service clubs, and community groups. Wendy Pearson from Carrie's Place remembers that local service clubs in her community would often provide volunteer labor to help support the refuge. Urban women's refuges also often received support from their local communities. For example, when the Elsie Collective claimed the two terrace houses in Westmoreland Street, they dropped a leaflet in their neighbor's letterboxes. The leaflet announced the group's plans to establish, quote, a refuge centre for women. Writing for the Tribune in March 1974, collective member Joyce Stevens stated that the distribution of the leaflet brought forth enthusiastic support in the form of good wishes, as well as material assistance. A large portion of the furniture for the houses was supplied by local residents, including beds, a lounge suite, and a refrigerator. Much of the early support that Elsie received, therefore, seems to have come from individuals and groups in the community who supported the collective's aim to establish a refuge for women and children escaping domestic violence, as well as raise awareness about this form of violence. However, some of the refuge workers at Carrie's Place believe that the community support the refuge received since its establishment in the late 1970s has less to do with what the organisation actually does and more to do with the fact that Carrie's Place was and still is an organisation operated by the Maitland community for the Maitland community. It is possible to speculate that both Carrie's Place and MDA's regional locations led to the creation of a type of community support that differed from that received by urban women's refuges and had less to do with each organisation's status as a women's refuge and much more to do with the fact that they were perceived by the community as local community organisations. Perhaps most importantly, however, Carrier's Place and MDA's regional locations also shaped how they raised community awareness about domestic violence. Urban feminist women's refuges typically attempted to raise community awareness about domestic violence by politicising the problem on a state and national level. However, regional women's refuges such as Carrier's Place and MDA focused their efforts on changing their local community's understandings and perceptions of this crime. The primary way in which both refuges did this was through education. Refuge workers for both Carrier's Place and MDA went out into the community and spoke to local service clubs, community groups and educators about what domestic violence was and how each of the refuges was working to support women and children who were experiencing this form of abuse. Lynn's Place in particular also made a concerted effort to send both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal refuge workers to Perfleet where the majority of Tari's Aboriginal population resided to educate women about domestic violence and also build relationships with that community. Tari's place was less active than Lynn's place when it came to physically going out into the community to raise awareness about domestic violence. However, Anna Hartree argues that workers at the refuge use their everyday interactions with other local support services to educate them and improve their understandings of domestic violence. It can also be assumed that many of the people working for these additional support services, such as Centrelink and the housing department and schools, were residents of the Maitland area and its surrounds. Therefore, by giving them a better understanding of what domestic violence was, how it operated and its impact on women and children, the workers at Carrie's Place were, in turn, raising awareness within the local community about domestic violence. As well as physically going out into the community and speaking to them about domestic violence, both Carrier's Place and MDA also developed other strategies to educate the community. For example, in the mid-1990s, MDA secured a $20,000 grant from the New South Wales State Government to produce and distribute a short educational film about Aboriginal women's experiences of domestic violence. Lynn's Place had been involved in training other agencies to cater to the needs of Aboriginal women experiencing family violence. However, they found that there were no existing resources that depicted Aboriginal people in domestic violence situations. 
So the Refuge decided to make their own film to fill this gap. The film was titled Don't Bash the Loving Out of Me, a reference to a 1995 poem written by Maureen Watson, an Aboriginal activist, performer and storyteller. The purpose of the film, according to Lynn's Places manager, was to help people understand that domestic violence is, quote, a complex issue. It's not a simple black and white issue. Recording the history of the women's refuge movement in regional New South Wales is also a matter of urgency, as these services are increasingly coming under threat. The research that I've presented to you today has been based on oral history interviews I've conducted with women who have worked and volunteered for both Carrie's Place and Lynn's Place. However, Lynn's Place no longer exists. After over 30 years of being run by local women from the Tari community, the management of the refuge was handed over to the faith-based charity The Samaritans in mid-2014 as part of the Going Home, Staying Home reform. This year, the History Council of New South Wales has asked us to contemplate what is history good for? Well, in this instance, while Lynn's Place may no longer exist, Oral history has allowed for the women at the centre of this refuge to reclaim the narrative of their organisation and have their voices and experiences added to the historical record. Similarly, using oral history to uncover how women's refuges oper operated in regional New South Wales has complicated and enriched our broader understandings of the women's refuge movement by revealing how the women's refuge movement operated within different geographical and social contexts. Thank you.